Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Let me greet us tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for tuning in. You know, we have been on the series, The Accepted and the Rejected Kings. And I pray that as we get in the word a little from this, that you know, the Lord will really bless your heart. Again, we thank you for tuning in. And let us just pray right now. Lord, we come to you tonight and we thank you for your love and your mercies. We thank you for this opportunity to be here to share, to look into the word. We ask, mighty God, that you will have your own way in our midst, even at this moment. We pray that you will touch everyone that tune in even those who are tuning right now, those who are tuning in sometime in the future, we pray, God, that the anointing will go forward and that it will accomplish what you will. We pray, God, that you will touch our hearts and that you will stir our hearts and that you will bring a change that we might be individuals, mighty God, and vessels worthy to be called your own. We pray, mighty God, that you will have your own way right now as we give a thanks, mighty God, in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. So we have been looking at the topic, the rejected and the accepted kings. And we have been looking at the lives of King Saul and David. Mostly right now we are talking about King Saul. If you are tuned in last week and the week before, you would have recognized that we are spending some time to deal with King Saul. As we have established, there is a lot that we can learn as it pertains to our walk with God. Because if we see the wrong and we see things you know, that other individuals do, you know, we can learn not to do the same. And in, in essence, we will please the Lord. So we have been looking at the scripture first, Samuel chapter 15, verse 18 to 28. We have read this passage two weeks ago. And tonight we will only look at verse 26. We want to just find verse 26. And we want to read that tonight. And Samuel, verse 26, And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. And really this is our key verse, if we, as we get into the lesson, um, God chose Saul as king and reached the point where God now had rejected Saul. So we want to do a bit of recap. What we have gone through last week so we can have you know, good continuity as we, you know, present on the life of Saul still. Amen. All right. So first Samuel nine, fifteen to twenty seven, we were actually going through the scripture and we look at the call of Saul, Saul's call to be king. And, you know, we said that God selected Saul to be king over Israel. He could have selected any other individual, but, you know, there was something in Saul at that time, and God chose him to be the king. Now, God re reveals his selection to the prophet Samuel by directing him to anoint King Saul. He said 
in that passage, 1 Samuel 9, 15 to 27, Now the Lord, we're not going to read everything. The Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow, about this time, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him commander over my people Israel, that he may save my people from the hand of the Philistine. For I have looked upon my people because their cry has come up to me. Verse 17. So when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, There he is, the man of whom I spoke to you. This is the one who shall reign over my people. So God revealed the selection to the prophet Samuel and he directed Samuel to anoint Saul. I would like us to understand, and we made the point last week, that Saul was led to the call through a sequence of events that occurred as he performed normal living activities. You know, he had left home to find his father, his father donkey, and he had a servant that accompanied him, and they left and they searched for the donkeys diligently, but they did not find the donkeys, right? But it was through the normal living activities that, that, that God led Saul to be king. And we discussed, we, we mentioned a little bit about Moses last week, and we said that you know, it was the same thing with Moses. Moses, it was while he was attending to his father's father-in-law, animals, right? Why God revealed himself to him. Amen. And that was in Genesis chapter 2, 5. Genesis chapter 3, sorry. Verse 2 through to verse 5. The Lord led Saul to Samuel through a sequence of events, we said. And Saul accepted his servant's counsel to seek advice from the prophet. So Saul was at the point where he was about to turn back, and his servant said, no man, let us go to the man of God that is in the town. And, you know, let us go to the man of God in the town, and he will be able to direct us. First Samuel 9, 6, but the servant replied, look, in this town, there is a man of God. He is highly respected, and everything he says come true. Let us go now, perhaps, he will tell us the way to take. The following day, Saul, Sam, Saul was anointed, and he was anointed privately by Samuel, and only Saul and Samuel knew it. You can go to the next slide. So we made this point last week. We said a person, call, a person that God's called to do a work will know we said that God will choose an effective way to communicate the call to the individual. He did so with Saul by leading him through normal conduct. And he came to Samuel and Samuel anointed him. Amen. And then when we say for Moses, right, the Lord communicated to him as he performed normal living duties. So the Lord has a way to effectively communicate to the individual what he calls him to do. He said to Peter, come with me and I will make you fishers of men. Right? God led Saul to the call through normal activities. Right? And we said last week that if folks, are, folks will sometimes miss the directive or the call of the Lord if they are looking for something extraordinary. They are looking to hear a loud voice. They are looking you know, for some extraordinary things. And sometimes God will use the simple things, the everyday thing. And, you know, if you look in the life, even of the life of David, you'll recognize that it was while David was taking care, his normal duties, you know, that the Lord taught him how to fight. And then from that, the Lord called him, you know, to be, to be king, right? So it, it is some of the simplest things that the Lord used you know, to direct us 
on the path that he wants to go. So let us not don't take stock of the, the things that we consider simple, you know, but let us just look at them, observe them, and see what God is doing in our lives. So when we now look at the life of Saul, we say that his initial, his initial behavior, even before he was king, was that he was humble, right? In 1 Samuel 9, 20 and 21, you know, as they were looking for the asses, right? And they came to the prophet Samuel. Samuel now began to talk to Saul. And he said, for thine asses that were lost three days ago, set not thine mind on them, for they are found. And on whom is the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee and on all thy father's house? And Saul answered and said, I am, am I not a Benjamite? of the smallest tribe of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin. Wherefore, then speakest thou to me. So the prophet was saying to Saul, to, to Saul that look here, the king that the people desire, you are the king. And the man response was so humble. Amen. He said, look here, I am, I, am I not a Benjamite of the smallest tribe? Of Israel, you know, my family is the least among families in Benjamin. You know, so what he said show that he was humble. What he said show that he was humble. Again, we also mention that when Samuel anointed him king, Samuel gave Amen. Write down the, 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 the decrees in a book. Right. Which means that the, the people were supposed to brought gift, bring gifts to him. But there was a family right, that did not bring any gifts. There was a family that did not bring any gift. And Saul did not pay them any mind. The man humbled himself. So again, it came to pass when they were come that they look on Eliab. So this point was that we were, this point that I'm saying no, is that there was none like him, right, in all Israel. So this was the second point no. So Saul was, even though he was taller than everybody, right, he, his heart, amen. Remember we said no, God is a heart God and God looks at the heart. So when they came and they were selecting, you know, another king, you know, when Samuel saw Eliab, he said, surely the Lord anointing is before me. You know, but the Lord said to Samuel, look not on his countenance or on his height or his stature, because I have refused him for the Lord see it not as man see it. For man look at on the outward appearance, but the Lord look at the heart. So God is really and heart God. So though there was none like him, right, in all Israel, then we said also the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and changed him and made him into a different person and gave him another heart. And we made a point last week that this was extremely important for us. Why? If our hearts are not in the right place, then the Lord will not select us to do even the simplest of things in his house. And, you know, some folks, you know, wonder why, Lord, I, I, I would like to do some things in the house, but, you know, I am being overlooked. Sometimes, you know, we have to check where our heart is. We have to check even the motive why it is that we would like to do some things in the house. If the motive is not right, if the heart is not in the right place, then the Lord, amen, will not use you to do his will. And then we said that Saul was able to exercise self-control, right? And we made mention of it a while ago. Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom and he wrote it in a book. And Saul went home to Gibeah 
and there went with him a band of men whose hearts God touched. But verse 27, but the children of Belial said, how shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no present. They brought him no gifts, but he held his peace. And this showed that Saul was able to exercise good self-control. So when we, we also mention 1 Samuel 11, 1 to 10, which talks about Saul's initial success as king. After the victory, the people said unto Samuel, you know, bring those men come, the children of Belial, that says, shall Saul lead us? And let us kill them. And Saul said, no, don't kill them. For today the Lord had wrought salvation in Israel, so he showed excellent self-control and in the process he gave the glory to God so Saul was anointed and appointed king over Israel and he did everything he commanded he was commanded to do so this is where we left off last week and we are just picking up back from here so anything from onward is what we are presenting to us now, right? So Saul was anointed and appointed king over Israel, and he did everything he was commanded to do, right? His heart was in a good place. There was none like him among men, in a, um, among the people. He showed excellent self-control. He exercised mercy to the same children of Belial, and he gave God the glory. But when we look at 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 1, Saul reigned for one year, and when he had reigned two years, he began to do some things. And as we go down, anything we read now from chapter 13 down, it is after the two-year mark. So the Israelites found themselves in a position where the Philistines gathered against them to fight them. The first thing Saul did wrong, it was a great multitude, 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and the people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. This drove fear in the hearts of the children of Israel. Right? So the children of Israel saw the multitude. And they were afraid. Right? So the first thing Saul did was to offer the peace and the burnt offering. 1 Samuel 9, 1 Samuel 13, verse 9 to through to 13. Yes, let us turn to find that one. 1 Samuel 13, 9 to 13. And Saul said, bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offering. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass, So he offered the, the burnt offering. He, he, he told them, look here, bring it, come. And, 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 and it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. And Samuel said, what hast thou done? And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Mitmash. Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down upon me to Gilgal, and I have made supplication unto the Lord. I Force myself, therefore, and offered burnt offering. Saul should not have offered peace offering 
and the birth offering. So this was the first thing that he did wrong. Under the system which was given to Israel by the Lord, only the priests were authorized by God to make these offerings. So when the peace offering and the burnt offering was to be offered, it was only to be done by the priests. And Saul now saw the people scattered and he saw the people trembling and he said, I force myself to offer the peace offering and to offer the burnt offering. In essence, he was disobedient to the command of the Lord. He knew that it was the priest that should have offered the burnt offering. But instead, he took it upon himself and he offered the burnt offering and the peace offering. What happened? That after two years, that he began to do these things. Something must have been happening in his heart Why, after two years he, he, he started doing these things. This was not a light thing, you know, because this was established in Israel for years. But then the, the, the king saw it fit for what was established for years to go against it. So what happened in his heart that after two years, he began to do these things. Again, we come back to the heart. His heart was not in the right place. His heart was in the right place before he was anointed king. But now that he was anointed king, after two years, his heart was not in the right place. And I pause here tonight to make this point that our hearts must be in the right place. After two years, after three years, four years of serving God, we must try to make sure that our heart is in the right place. God is a heart God. And our heart condition must be right. How can a person change like this? After two years, after he started out doing everything right, how can a person change like this? He said, I force myself, therefore, to offer the burnt offering. So he started out by following the commandment of the Lord. Everything that Saul instructed him to do, he did. Samuel instructed him to do, sorry, he did. So he started out by following the command of the Lord. But after two years, he changed and have now reached a point where he forced himself, oh glory to God, to do the wrong. If we know that the thing is wrong, do not force ourselves to do it. You know that God gives each and, us, each and every one of us the ability to choose. And within us, we know right from wrong. For those of, of us who have the Holy Spirit, what God does through the Holy Spirit is to convict us. So that even if we're doing wrong, the whole, and not so sure, the Holy Spirit will now convict us and tell us that, you know, what you're doing is not right. But when we know that the thing is wrong and force ourselves to do it, Something is wrong. So we know that the thing is wrong and force ourselves to do it. Something is wrong and we are going against some things. So when we force ourselves to do the wrong, we go against what we know to be true. The Bible says now the truth shall set you free. So if you go against truth, you can't be free anymore. So if we know the thing is right, let us do the thing that is right. And if it is wrong, let us shun the, thing that, the things that are wrong. You see, if we go against God and we do the wrong, we are going against even our belief system. You know that it takes a lifetime to develop a belief system. At the heart of which are our presuppositions. 
and it takes years to, 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 to mold some of these things. And you, when we go against the wrong, we're going against our belief system. We're going against established principles, principles that are laid down for our safeguard. God told them that the, it was the priest because the thing is supposed to do a particular way. And it is the priest alone I want to do these things. And Saul offered it up and went against established principles. He offered it up and went against the command of the Lord. If we find ourselves forcing ourselves to do the wrong, we're going against the command of the Lord. We're going against our own belief system. We're going against what we know to be truth. And we're going against established principles. It is best to trust the Lord and remain true to his word. As people of God, we need to develop a resistance against doing the, against doing the wrong things. Wrong thing are things. James 4 verse 7. It says resist the devil and he will flee from you. The king sinned presumptuously. He knew the right thing but did the wrong. James 4 verse 17. He said therefore to him that knoweth how to do good and doeth it not to him. It is sin. So if brethren, if we know how to do the right thing, and we know the right thing, and we keep on doing the wrong thing, we need to check ourselves. As people of God, we need to develop a resistance against the things. We should determine to hold on to our integrity and serve the Lord with all our hearts. The adversary now will put things in front of us, but we have to resist him. That is why James tells us, resist him and he will flee from you. The king said, I force myself to do the wrong thing. He forced himself to offer the burnt offering and the peace offering. The king sinned presumptuously. First Samuel chapter 13, 13 to 14. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he command thee. For no would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But no, thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord had sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord had commanded him to be captain over his people. Because thou hast not kept that which the Lord command thee. Thou hast done foolishly. So the, the prophet said unto the king, Thou have done foolishly and have not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God. For no would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But then he passed a judgment. No, thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord had sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord had commanded him to be captain over his people because thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord. I want the church to know tonight that if we re read over it and we understand that here there was a judgment passed because Saul sinned. I want us to know that if we sin, the Lord will forgive us. 
but also we will be punished for those sin. There is some form of judgment. So this judgment was that his kingdom would not have continued. I believe, and I really not, I really don't want to teach my belief, but I believe this was not the first time he went against the commandment of the Lord. However, this was the first thing that the Bible recorded because of the magnitude. So after two years, he was in a backslidden state and he began to do some things. But because of the magnitude of this one, this one went against the established principles. It, it went against some things that were in Israel for years. So because of the magnitude known, the Bible record this one. He was not a priest. And he knew it was the priest that was supposed to offer the burnt offering and the peace offering. And he forced himself. The Lord not, would not have discontinued his kingdom for one offense. Proverbs 29, verse 1. Proverbs 29, verse 1. He that, being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. So it, 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 it could not, based upon the principles of Scripture, it could not be the first thing that he did. But it was the first thing that was recorded, I believe. So, the king was on the verge of a breakthrough. If King Saul had kept the commandment of the Lord, the Lord would have established his kingdom upon Israel forever. But because he sinned, the Lord took away the kingdom from him and gave it to another. Similarly, we might lose out if we go against the command of the Lord. So we might be on the verge of our breakthrough, you know. And I encourage us tonight to keep the command of the Lord. We know the ways of the Lord and we know what God requires. He requires us to walk holy. He requires righteousness. And I encourage us that we walk and that we keep the command of the Lord. So let us do what the Lord requires and he will Ward us accordingly. Deuteronomy 30, 19. He said, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curse. So choose life in order that you may live and that your descendants might live. So, so, so God is saying, was saying back then to them, you know, he said, I set before you to read the other part of the scripture, open door, and you know, you choose some things. But look here. There was witness against the children of that time, the children of Israel at that time in heaven. But also today there is witness against us. That God has set before us life and death. And if we follow the commandment of the Lord, then we choose in life. But if we follow not the commandment of the Lord, then we choose death. We can choose blessing and we can choose curse. Sometimes we run down certain things and pick up a curse in our life instead of the blessing. Job 34 verse 4. He said, let us choose for ourselves what is right. Let us know among ourselves what is good. So if we mean ourselves good, we need to walk in the ways of the Lord. So if we know, saints of God, we know certain things that we must do. We know that we should not have a, another brother or a sister in our hearts, but we do it. We know that we shouldn't take people's things, steal, touch your fingers, but we do it. Why? 
I will know what the Lord requires. We just know that there are certain things we, we must not do. And we keep on doing them. And I notice I said we. So I, I'm not. It's all of us. And remember none of us is perfect, you know. But you see, when you, when, when you know that God requires certain things, we need to try our best. If we mean ourselves any good, we need to try our best and do what the Lord requires. We cannot go around God's requirement, you know. Anything that God requires, that is what we must do. If you don't measure up to it, you fall short. God will not lower his standard for anyone. Amen. So Saul changed for the worse. Let us now look at 1 Samuel chapter 14, 1 to 14. We can just find that on, yes, put it up on the, on the, on the screen. This King Saul changed for the worse. Now it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man, that bear his armor. Come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father. So what happened here was that there was a standoff between the children of Israel and the Philistines. So Saul had a, a set of men with him Jonathan had a set of men with him. But, but Jonathan and his armor bearer, Jonathan, so verse 1 really tells us, and I'm just going to run down through the verses. Verse 1 tells us, Jonathan suggested to his armor bearer for them to go into the garrison of the Philistine. Verse 2, jump down to verse 6. So we can read through the, the, the passage. In our spare time, I know that we have gone through the book of Samuel not so long. But verse 6, And Jonathan said to the young man that bear his armor, Come, let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. So really the verse does tell us that, you know, they know made the decision to go into the garrison of the Philistine. Verse 7. So, so Jonathan and his armor bearer, Jonathan's armor bearer now, express his commitment to go with him. He said, anything that is in thine heart, do. And him said, I am with thee according to thy heart. So, so verse 7 tells us. Then verse 7 to 12 talks about the strategy that, that can go down to Verse 12, they talk about the strategy that, you know, they were going to use. Jonathan said, look here, if they tell us to come up, we know that it is the Lord that given them into our hands. And when they went over there, the, 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 the man said to them, come up. And Jonathan said, yes, he just called his armor bearer. And, you know, they were victorious in that instant. Verse 13 to 15 talks about Jonathan and his armor bearer of victory. Verse 16 talks about the effect. Let us look at 16. It talks about the effect that this first victory, this first slaughter that Jonathan and his armor bearer did. It talks about the effect now on the Philistine. And the verse 16. And the watchman of Saul in Gibeah. Gibeah. Of Benjamin, look and behold, the multitude melted away, and they went on beating down one on another. And there was trembling in the house, in the field, and among all the people, the garrison and the spoilers. They also trembled, and the earth quaked, so it was very great trembling 
So now let us look at verse 17. Then said Saul unto the people that were with him, Number no one see who is gone from us. And they had numbered the old Jonathan and his armor bearer went. We're not there. Verse 18. And Saul said unto Ahiah, Bring hither the ark. No, listen to this, you know. Bring hither the ark of God, for the ark of God was at the time with the children of Israel. Let us go back to the slides. All right, so we mentioned all of that Jonathan suggested. You know, they made a decision to go. All right, so skip the slides. Yes, go down a little bit more. We mentioned all of that. Go again. Yes, so the reason now, so we said that verse 18, and Saul said unto Ahiah, bring hither the ark of God. For the ark of God was at that time with the children of Israel. So the reason for the king calling for the ark at that time was to inquire of the Lord. Throughout Israel history, they have always called for the ark and the priests to inquire of the Lord. So the king was about to go in battle. He heard the rumblings over the, the garrison of the Philistine. And you know, he, he, he wondered what was happening. He said, let me, he said, priest, come with the ark and, and let me inquire of God. Judges, chapter 20, verse 27 through to 28. The children of Israel. So we're saying that normally the children of Israel call for the priest and the ark of the covenant when they want to inquire of the Lord. Saul called for the ark of the covenant because he wanted to inquire of the Lord. If he should go in battle. Because there was a disruption in the camp of the Philistine. So we just strengthen the point now that Israel right, called for the Ark of the Covenant, judges. So the children of Benjamin at that time. And the children of Israel inquired of the Lord for the Ark of the Covenant which was there in those days. And Phineas, the son of Eliza, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet go up to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? Or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into thy hand. So this is just a perfect example, because what happened here at that time was that there was a man that lost his wife, and his wife, you know, cheated on him, and, you know, he was willing to go back and to, to find his wife. And he stopped at a certain place in, in, in a, a town belonging to the tribe of Benjamin. And the men came there, and he gave them his wife. And they raped her, they ravished her, raped her, and she came back and died on his doorstep. So what the man did was cut her up and send her to the different tribes of Israel. The different tribes came together and said that, you know, we are going to avenge you. So we read where King Saul said, I am from the smallest tribe of Benjamin. We, if we look back, we recognize that the, the, the tribe of Benjamin was almost wiped out because of this scenario. Let us go to the, the other slide. So, King Saul called for the ark of the Lord and the priests 
and he did so because he wanted to inquire of the Lord. 1 Samuel 14, verse 19. And it came to pass while Saul talked unto the priests that the noise was in the host of the Philistine went on and increased. And Saul said unto the priest, Withdraw your hand. Saul told the priest to pull back his hand. In essence, he was saying, not now. Don't bother. I'm going into battle. In essence, the king went into battle and did not inquire of the Lord. The priest was there. The Ark of the Covenant was there. And he said, look here. Don't worry. I've got this. In essence. Was it a good time? To have inquired of the Lord. Lord, should I go in battle? I put it to us. That it was a very good time. To ask the Lord. Lord, should we go in battle? But him said, please hold back your hand, man. If we get to the point where we feel as if we don't have to inquire, where we don't have to ask the Lord for direction, then something is wrong. The fact that he told the, the, the priest demonstrated that he went to the battle with his own might. He was saying there was no need for the Lord right now. I got this. I want the church to understand tonight that we are in a spiritual battle. We are in a spiritual battle. And there is no way we can win in our strength. There is no way that we can be victorious in our strength. We were made a little bit lower than our enemies. The Apostle Paul tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and power. So our enemy is not the individual that we can see. The, our enemy is not the, the boss at the work. Our enemy is not the, the, the lecturer that is giving us an hard time. Our enemy is the adversary and those that fail with him. And as people of God, the adversary can use a vessel to stand up against you. So the individual that is giving you a hard time allows the adversary to use them to work against you. But really, we were made a little bit lower than our enemies. And if we were made a little lower than our enemies, it means then that the only way we can have the victory is by relying on the Lord. Which means that at all times, we are going to inquire of him. Lord, what is the next move? The songwriter said, my life is not my own. To you, I belong. I give myself to you. You see, if we give ourselves to God, it we would reach the point where if we are going, if we are coming in, we are making some critical decisions. We are saying, God, I need your direction. We are going to inquire of the Lord. The king was now at the point where he said, Please, don't bother. I don't, I don't want to hear. I am going into the battle. People of God, if we operate like this, 
we are just going to destroy ourselves. We are going to find ourselves in some position where we wonder how we reach here. It, was, it, it is because and it will be because we do not take the time to inquire of the Lord. Lord, what, would, what is my next move? David got the victory because he relied and inquire, inquired of the Lord. 1 Samuel 23 verse 1. First Samuel 23, verse 1. David was in hiding from King Saul. And it was told David that the Philistines are fighting against Keilah. And are looting the threshing floors. And David what? Inquired of the Lord saying. Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord answered him. It is a, you see when you, when you can inquire of the Lord. And the Lord answer you. Even when the, the mountains are tumbling on the left and the right. You know that you have a word from God. You know that you inquire of the Lord and the Lord answer you. I have talked to some folks, some folks at my workplace who are on the verge of leaving. And these guys are, when you work out the equivalent, it's like one million dollar a month they're going to work. No, I would like to work something like that per month, you know, but guess what happened? God give me a word. Years ago, I inquire of the Lord. Oh God, and he gave me a word. So, so, even though I am not working that amount, God give me a word and I have to satisfy, I have to trust the Lord with what he is giving me. So when folks come and say, Bailey, you're not, <laughs> I say, look here, I'm good. Because I have inquired of the Lord and God give me a word. So David was successful. Because he inquired of the Lord and the Lord gave him a word. He said, go up, attack the Philistine and see if Keilah. Let us go back to the slide. Psalms 20, Psalms 37, verse 23. The steps of a good man, the Bible said, is ordered by the Lord and he delight in his ways. Whatever we do, we must make sure that we find the mind of the Lord. You see, in this warfare we are in, there are times we have to make some decisions, you know, and some critical decisions. Because the decision that we make today will determine the turnout of our tomorrow. But whatever we have to do, whatever we in life turns, we must make sure that we find the mind of the Lord. We must make sure that we inquire of him. Let us not do like the, the, the king and say to the priest, we are kings and priests, so we don't need anybody to inquire of the Lord for us. We will inquire of the Lord for ourselves. But let us not rush into the thing. Without inquiring of the Lord. So if you're planning to get married, I don't know why I reach here. If, if, if you're planning to get married, people of God, child of God, make sure that you inquire of the Lord. Lord, what would you have me to do? Allow him to lead us, man. Allow him to lead you on the path that he wants to lead you. Allow him to direct your path. The Bible says as many that are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. 
to allow him through the Holy Spirit to direct our path. He is God. And he knew all things. He knew all our beginning. And he knew our end. What better person it is to direct our path? If he knows the beginning from the ending, then he knows the best path for you to traverse. Oh, glory to God. To take you to the end. Because at the end, I must be saved. I want to encourage us. Let us include the Lord in all our fears. Don't say, boy, look here. I hear the rumbling. No bother. I don't, I don't bother want you to inquire of the Lord. I don't want you to inquire of the Lord again. Let me go and get the victory. We cannot have the victory. We cannot get the victory on our own. We need the Lord. There was a story that was told of this young lady. A story that was told of this young lady that was going she was going out with her friends upon leaving her mother told her go with God. So you know the mother spent years trying to teach this girl do this girl the way of the Lord try to teach her the principles of God and grow her up, try her very best to grow her up in the right way. Her mother, when she was going to church, took her to church, sent her to Sunday school. But this girl was big and you know the, the older they get, they kinda you know, they feel like they are their own big person. So she said, Go with God. The, this young lady turned to her mother and said, Look here, God can ride in the trunk. The story said that this, this young girl and her friends met in an accident. And the car was completely mashed up. Except for the trunk. The same trunk that the girl said that God must ride in. Is the same trunk that was left undisturbed. Let us not do like this young lady, or for that matter, King Saul, and leave the Lord out of our affairs. Let us include him in everything. You know, you know as I prepare myself, and as I went on the road, uh, there, there was this little sticker on the car. And it says, include the Lord in everything. I'm going to say, God, what I think you man is the same thing that I plan to talk about tonight. And there was a sticker on the car that says, include the Lord in everything that you do. I want to encourage the people of God tonight. Include the Lord in everything that you do. Let us not do like this young lady. Let us not do like King Saul. So let's look now at this slide. As King Saul drew further from God, he became egotistical and self-centered. Egotistic and self-centered. First Samuel 14, verse 24. He said, Curse be the man that eat food until it is evening, and I... I am avenged of mine enemies. All right. So what we have spoken earlier on was that the, 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 the Saul son, Saul's son, Jonathan, and his armor bearer went now into the garrison of the Philistine and they discomforted them. It caused the camp of the 
Philistine to be uneasy. King Saul was about to inquire of the Lord and he changed his mind. And now he was going into battle. As a matter of fact, he was now in the battle. He was now in battle and he just gave out a decree curse be the man who eats food until it is evening and i am avenge that word should be of my enemies until i am avenge of my enemies the will of God and God's honor were of no concern of Saul in this oath. And that's why we made a point before this, you know, that we need to include God, we need to talk to God, we need to inquire of if he had inquired of the Lord before, if he had inquired of the Lord before he went in battle. I don't believe that Saul would have given out a decree like this. Cursed be the man who eats food until I be until it's evening, and I am avenge on my enemies. Note is egotism and note is self-centeredness. I am avenge on mine enemies and this wasn't even the full decree of what he said in first samuel 14 44 he said god do so to me and more also you shall surely die so if the persons know they were in battle you know From morning until evening. And Saul said, no one must eat any food until I am avenged. Next slide. While he was afraid that if he took the time... To refresh himself, he and his army, the Philistine would have escaped out of their hands. The adoration that he made was defeating his own intention. The decree that he made, that he gave, was defeating his own intention. The people were exhausted and wanted food. They could not have continued in pursuit of their enemies. First Samuel 14, 31 to 34. And they smote the Philistine that day from Mitchmash to a Hydralon. And the people, and the people were very faint. The people them, they, they were in battle. They used up the energy. They were running down. They were swinging their sword. And the people were very faint. They were weary. They wanted something to eat. Verse 32 says, And the people flew upon the spoils and took the sheep and oxen and calves and slew them on the ground and the people did eat with their blood. Oh God. So the people were faint. And he gave an adoration that nobody mustn't eat until evening. Until I am avenged.
You see, we, oh God. You see where the man reached now? When he was just anointed king. And they were going to kill the sons of Belial. He said, no one should die. Because the victory was wrought by the Lord. At this point, the man was at the stage where he said, don't eat until I be avenged. It's not, it's not anything more about the Lord, you know. But it was now about him. Genesis 9, 3 and 4. So he caused Israel to sin, right? And the adjuration that he gave caused the people to eat the blood. From as far back, As Genesis chapter 9, the Lord commanded Noah not to eat the life of any flesh. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. As for the green herbs, I have given you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall he not eat. So, we, we have seen videos now where people just kill the goat and drink the blood. What God is saying, and he gave it to Noah. He said, you can eat every living thing for meat. But he said, the blood thereof shall he not eat. All right, I want you to find for me Leviticus chapter 17. Verse 10 through to verse 12. So everything you can eat, but not the blood. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, you see why the thing was wrong. This adoration that he gave, you know, the decree that he gave. I'm saying, nobody must eat. The men were so fiend that when they see the spoils, they just kill them and start eating them at the same time. And so whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood and will cut him off from among the people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it up on the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Therefore, I say unto the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. So this adoration that the man gives caused the people to sin. They went against what was written in the scripture. Again we see the king that was selected by the Lord, that was anointed by the prophet of the Lord, caused the people 
to sin. It was a significantly serious thing the king caused the people to do. The Lord said the life is in the blood. I have given the blood for an atonement for your sins. You should not eat the blood. And the king caused the people to eat the blood. It was a significantly serious thing that the king caused them to do. Verse 33. Verse 33 of First Samuel 14. So, the people that were at war ate the blood. They were so hungry. Then, they told Saul, saying, Behold, the people sin against the Lord, in that they eat with the blood. And what did Saul say? He have transgressed. Roll a great stone unto me this day. So he was saying, My God, what a people. Look how the people sin. And he did not even realize that he was the one that caused the people to sin. He sees their faults, but not his own. In giving an occasion for the people to sin. Saul then sends out the officer and charges the people that any more beasts that is being killed should be killed on this place so that you can it so that it can be inspected that the blood is drained from the body. So I said, disperse yourselves among the people and say unto them, Bring me either every man his ox and every man his sheep, and slay them here. And eat and sin not against the Lord in eating with the blood. And all the people brought every man his ox with him that night and slew them there. But it was the action of Saul that caused the people to sin. He sees their faults. But not his own. He did not see that he was the one that caused the, the, the people to sin. And this is why we need to continue to pray for our leaders. Yes, those who lead the country. Those who deal with the affairs of the country. But even so, much more those that deal with your soul. Leaders are but just men and are susceptible to doing the wrong things. And we can do the wrong things and lead a soul to stray. This is why we need to pray that our church leaders find the mind of the Lord and follow the leading of the Spirit so that we are not led into condemnation. There are so-called churches many. And right now a lot of souls are being led astray because of the leader. This is why people who leave their homes gather on a Sunday or whichever day of the week. And worship. Need to pray for your leader and say, God, give us a leader that will follow you every step of the way. 
Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. We want a leader that is following the, 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 the direction of the Lord. It was because of Saul's foolish decision he was about to kill his son. So I don't have the scriptures, but let me just tell you what was happening. So the, they were in battle for all the, the entire day. And when the man came, the men came to a certain place, they saw a log with only running from it. And Jonathan dipped the edge of his spear, his spear in the honey and tasted it. And the Bible said his eye light up at that moment. At that moment, he find new strength to continue in battle. Now the people look at, at, at Jonathan, you know, because but Jonathan did not hear when his father gave that adoration to say. No one should eat until evening and until I'm avenged of my enemies. And Saul wanted to kill his son. Because his son tasted. We're going to go down a little bit and we're going to read a little bit about that. But look at 1 Samuel. And the first slaughter with Jonathan and his son and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within, as it were, an half an acre of land, which a yoke of oxen might plow. So let us look at. First Samuel 14, verse 35 down. And Saul built an altar unto the Lord. No, I want us to, to, to understand what the Bible is saying to us, you know. And I want us to, 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 to follow. And the Bible said, this was the first altar that he built unto the Lord. Can you imagine? All this time that he was anointed king. It had never occurred to him to build an altar before the Lord. It was at this point, after two years plus, the Bible was careful to say that he built his first altar unto the Lord. Verse 36. And Saul said, Let us go down after the Philistine by night and spoil them until the morning light. And, and let us not leave a man of them. And they said, do whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Then said the priest, let us draw near hither unto God. So this was the same priest now that him said, don't bother inquire. Then the priest said, let us draw, draw near hither unto God. And Saul asked counsel of God. Shall I go down after the Philistine? Will thou deliver them into the hand of Israel? But he answered him not that day. You know, when I think about this, I tremble. You know, I will never want to get to the position where God don't talk to me. Where God don't answer me. Where God, God don't convict me about certain things. 
This is similar to it. You know, the Bible says that God answered him not that day. Verse 38. And Saul said, draw he near hither, all the chief of the people, and know and see wherein this sin had been this day. So because the Lord did not answer, he, he surmised that somebody sinned. And because somebody sinned, that is why the Lord did not give an answer. Verse 38, verse 39. No, go back to 38. Sorry. And Saul said, Draw in near hither all the chief of the people and know and see wherein this sin had been this day. 39. For as the Lord liveth which saveth Israel, though it be in Jonathan my son, he shall what? Surely die. But there was not a man among the people that answered him. So there were men there that knew that Jonathan dipped his spear in the onion and tasted, you know. So, so all along this man was saying that somebody sinned, that's why he don't get an answer from God. Not looking at his own fault to say it was the decision that he made. Why the people sin. Next verse. Then said he unto all Israel, Be ye on one side, and I and Jonathan my son will be on the other side. And the people said unto Saul, Do what seemeth good unto thee. Therefore Saul said unto the Lord, God of Israel, Give a perfect lot. And Saul and Jonathan were taken. But the people escaped. Which means that the people, the lot did not fall on the people. None of them sinned. And so I said, cast lot between me and Jonathan, my son. And Jonathan was taken. Then Saul said to Jonathan, tell me what thou hast done. And Jonathan told him and said, I did but taste a little honey with the end of the rod that was in my hand. And lo, I must die. And Saul answered, God do so and more also, for thou shalt surely die, Jonathan. Now remember, this was the same king that had mercy, that exercised mercy on the children of Belial. You know? But at this point, the man knew nothing near mercy. This was how far the man had gone. This was how how much he had changed from the individual that God anointed. The man exercised mercy. The children of Belial disrespected him, you know. They brought him no gifts. And the man, the man didn't even pay them any mind. When he was victorious, his first victory, the man said, look here, carry him, come. And he said, no. Exercise mercy. But at this point, his son, which did not hear the adoration that he gave, said, look here, you shall surely die, Jonathan. This tells you where the man, the man was now a wicked man. The same man that God anointed. The same man that had a good heart. 
is the same man that his heart was completely changed. Next verse. And the people said unto Saul, Shall Jonathan die? So, so look here now. In essence, the people now stand up against the king. You know, remember, the king was the man. The, the, the king gave out an edict. And look here. is what him say goes. And the people now stand against him. Because, you see, if leaders, as leaders, you see, if we don't follow God and lead the people of God, how God wants us to lead them, the people will stand up against us. So the people, in essence, stand up against Saul, you say, no, and say, Jonathan shall not die. Who hath wrought this great salvation in Israel? God forbid, as the Lord liveth, there shall not an hear on his head fall to the ground. For he hath wrought with God this day, so the people rescued Jonathan, that he did not die. Jonathan's own father wanted to kill him. The man's heart was in a place, he was in a backslidden state, backslidden state and he was no, at the point where his heart was wicked. That is why I told us, you know, if the sons of Belial had did that at this point in Saul's reign, they're dead. Would have read something different if it was at this time they didn't bring any presents to him. Because of his own foolish decision. He was about to kill his son. Next slide. He was about to kill his son because of his own foolish decision. Now let us look at 1 Samuel 15, 1 to 10. Samuel also said unto Saul, I believe, before we get into this passage, I believe that the Lord was willing, even after all that Saul did, was willing to give Saul another chance. One songwriter sings, is the God of a second chance. He was willing to give Saul, a second chance. Oh God. First Samuel 15, verse 1. Samuel said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee king, to, to anoint thee to be king over his people. Over Israel. Know therefore, hearken thou unto the voice of the Lord. One more chance God given him. Next. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. And spare them not, but slay both man, woman, infant, and suckling, and sheep, and camel, and ass. God cannot be any clearer. He said, this was everything. And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Tel Aim. 200,000 footmen. And 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. 
And Saul said unto the, Can the, the Canaanites, Go, depart, get you down from among the Amal Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For he showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Canaanites depart from among the Amalekites. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilia until the bill comes to shore that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refused, that they destroyed utterly. Then came the word of the Lord to Samuel, saying, It repented me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me, and had not performed all my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. So after all that Saul did, God was still willing to work with him. Amen. He, we knew, and we know that God is a merciful God. We know that God is a merciful God. God. After everything that Saul did, God was still willing to work with him. So that is why God now called him and said, look here. I still believe in you, you know. But, but this is what I want you to do. I want you to go and destroy Amalek because I remember what they did. God was still willing to work with Saul. He is a God that allows room for repentance. It was in one, his one words in Proverbs 28 verse 13, you know, that says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. At this point, if King Saul had made up in his mind to change his ways, to to, to find his way back to God and, and to start follow the commandment of the Lord. God would have had mercy on him. God was willing to give him another chance. Hence, this is what I want you to do. Destroy Amalek. Go and smite Amalek. And utterly destroy all that they have. And spear them not. But slay about men, women, infant, and suckling, ox, and sheep, camel, and ass. God was clear, spear nothing. Nothing means nothing. Some of would ask, what part of nothing you don't understand? <laughs> but God says spear nothing. <laughs> oh God. I wonder if Saul felt that nothing meant to spear the king and spear the best of the spoils. But nothing means, and God said, spear nothing. God was willing to work with him at this point. If he had repented, God would have had mercy on him. I believe that God would have even probably established him. But because of all that the man was doing, God, God bring him to the point and God will bring us to the point, you know. I cut us off. The Bible says that King Saul, after God commanded him and said nothing, King Saul speared Agag. I believe that he speared Agag as a trophy.
Look what I did. This is my trophy. I can do with the king, this great king, whatever I will. I can humiliate him. Right? And he said, Spear Agag. And the best of the sheep and of the oxen and the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good. And would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile, vile and refused, they utterly destroyed. Saul outrightly disobeyed the command of the Lord. He outrightly disobeyed the commandments of the Lord. And I say it, and I say it again, I believe that if he was if he, came, if he had came to the point of repentance, had come to the point of repentance and carried out the commandment of the Lord in this aspect, God would have had mercy on him. There is a cut-off point with God. And for Saul, this was it. He did many things. Caused the people to sin against God. But there is a cut off point with God. And with for Saul, this was it. God said, look here, it repented me that I made Saul king. It repented me that I made Saul king. Samuel was not there, you know, and the word of the Lord came to Samuel. And the Bible says Samuel wept all night. If we are doing wrong, I want us to understand that there is a cut-off point with God. Proverbs 29 verse 1, we send it already. He that being often reproved, harden his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. If we find ourselves doing some things and we are being warned by God, remember there is a cut-off point. God is Immutable. He changes not. He rejected King Saul. And he will do the same to us today. He is the same yesterday. Today. And forever. And he will cut us off. If we walk contrary to his words, if we walk contrary to his commandments, if we continue to sin presumptuously, there is a cut-off point. Yes, God is long-suffering. Yes, his will is that none perish and that all come to repentance. But there is a point that God will say, this is it. And with that, I close tonight. God's willing, next week, we will pick up and we will continue 
But God changes not. Just as we cut off King Saul, if we continue to go against his commands, God will cut us off today. God bless you tonight in the name of the Lord. Thank you for tuning in. And all being well, next week we will pick up. Just bow your heads while I dismiss in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we want to bless your name again. We thank you for all that was said tonight. And we know that you have spoken. We pray, God, that you will help us to, to guard our hearts. Help us to seek you in all that we do. Help us, mighty God, to surrender our will to yours. We pray, mighty God, that you will be our guide, that you will be our strength, and that we will rely on you every step of the way. Help us, mighty God, in this difficult time to live for you. When all is said and done, we would like to hear, well done, though good and faithful servant. We pray, mighty God, for the many folks tuning in tonight, that you will bless them with a special blessing. We pray, God, that you bless them with all spiritual blessing. That you'll strengthen them with all spiritual strength. And God, that you supply all their needs according to your riches in glory. We give you thanks tonight for what was said. Pray that you'll continue to keep us and strengthen us as we go through the rest of the week. We pray that you'll go before us. We pray, God, that you'll change our hearts. Give us a new heart. Give us a heart that will be surrendered and totally sold out to you. Let your perfect will be done tonight as we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. God bless you once again. God bless you. God richly bless you. And have a prosperous rest of the week by way of announcement. Please remember that this Friday is Jerk Friday. We're asking you to come and purchase a lunch, purchase a dinner. We're asking you to get individuals from your workplace to, 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 to purchase. Um, there is delivery service for a certain amount of lunch. And you can call in 905-0484. And you, will, you can talk to somebody and you can give them your order. Then on Sunday, it's a mission Sunday, and the mission department is pushing for double attendance drive. We are asking for each person to bring a person, bring an individual, bring a neighbor, bring a friend, bring somebody, and let us worship God together in the beauty of holiness. God bless you again in the name of the Lord.